All right, Alex, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, I'm very pleased to announce today that it is our ninth anniversary, our seventh anniversary, rather. Uh, it was actually our seventh anniversary a couple of days ago, but for um, a number of reasons, we didn't. Why am I not presenting properly here? Hang on for a second, everybody. Here we go. Happy anniversary, seven years of the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, this was a couple of weeks ago. We started on June 7th of um, a few years back, seven years ago. And every year I kind of like to um, have a little session where we talk about what we've done, where we are, because the Astro Imaging Channel is not just a presentation with questions and things like that every Sunday night. It's a it's a it's a group effort where we put a lot of work into getting speakers and presentations and things like that. And uh, we like to share it with you and tell you where we are because I mean you're all part of it, all the people who are watching this thing. So you, you should know where we are and it's it's more than just the show. Uh, some analytics. We've had more than a million views in our seven years, and 200,000 of those came within the last year. That means that through the seven years, more than a quarter of a million hours have been spent watching the Astro Imaging Channel programs at one time or another, either live or uh, when people come in later and, and watch it. And for many programs, they get watched over and over. And for many programs, they get watched just one little part at a time because somebody remembered something. They went back and found that particular part and they watched that particular part again. Um, we have nearly 11,000 subscribers now. If you are not a subscriber, we strongly suggest you go ahead and, and click down there and become a subscriber. Uh, we have 2,000 subscribers have joined us in the last year. So that's our analytics. We're doing okay. There's more analytics, though. Who are we? Well, unfortunately, we're overwhelmingly male. Now, i got nothing against males. They're okay. But um, I think that all hobbies are better if they represent the everybody, okay? And we need more females involved in this. We made actually an effort to do that. Over the last year, we had eight women make presentations on the Astro Imaging Channel out of about oh, like 49 or something like that shows. We don't have too many young people, but um, this demographic here surprised me. I thought we'd all be old farts really down here someplace. But in fact, we've got a pretty good mix of people all through most of the adult age groups. So I'm, I'm happier with that than I thought I would be. Uh, we come from all over the place. Our 81 countries are all together represented. Most of them, 46% or something in the United States. But like I said, 81 countries, mostly English speaking, but we got people from all over the world. Um, there are some milestones, some things that we did. Some of these are important because we set them as goals to do, and, and some of them are just interesting things. Uh, we passed 10,000 subscribers about Christmas time, and you probably remember if you've been watching the show that I spent a long time trying to encourage people to sign up because it means a lot of um, it means a lot to the, what we can do. Um, it enables us to get a larger reach. Google pays more attention to us. YouTube pays more attention to us and gives us more things we can do. Um, since uh, Christmas, we've added about a thousand people and we're proud of that. Our growth continues as far as the subscriptions. If you haven't subscribed, hit that subscription button down below. We have a full calendar. By full calendar, I'll notice, you'll notice that we've got somebody coming virtually all the time. And I wanted to um, I wanted to emphasize the fact that we don't have any more open sessions where we sit down and we go, I don't know, what do you want to talk about? I don't know, what do you want to talk about? No, we actually have something that uh, we have a scheduled presenter nearly every um, week we have one, and we're no longer relying on our core team. There was a period of time where, gosh, I gave three or four sessions over a couple of months. Eric did, Terry did, um, Molly did. We were all, we were doing the work. We were doing the presenting. Luckily, we've overcome that. As you can see, our, our calendar is fairly full. 
one of the things I want to note is um, we kind of made a real mess last week because um, actually our last two weeks have not been good technically wise because of a, a number of things. And I'll get to that in a minute. But Rory Clark was supposed to be here and we had to pull the show because of a power failure. And the power failure meant we didn't have an Internet to run the show. So Rory couldn't give his show, but we've rescheduled him to August 15th. So if you want to see Rory talk about his experience with his next dome building, it's going to be August 15th. Madison's here tonight, and Neil is going to be here next week with Planetary Imaging. Uh, then we're going to take the 4th of July off because it's Independence Day here in the United States. So that's what we're going to be doing for the 46% of you who are in the United States. And then we have a, oh, Ron is going to be talking here. I know I uh, just got that today. He's going to be talking about uh, choosing equipment for image scale. But you'll notice starting August 8th and then further on, we've got some empty blanks. We need more. So, but our milestone that I'm really proud of for this year is that we have basically filled the calendar and we're doing, we're doing really well there. And that's something important to celebrate when you come to that anniversary soul searching as to how you're doing. Um, we've had a lot more contributions from, from uh, participation by the club, by all you guys out there. You sent us a lot of comments for Neo Wise on Parade and, you, and Orion. Oh, God, you had lots of Orion pictures. And you've got even more um, uh, of the uh, gorgeous galaxies coming in, but we we'll, won't be seeing those until mid-July uh, uh, mid or maybe a little bit later. Um, We've also done really, really well on something that I've mentioned a few times. We now have a database of all our programs. We're keeping track of all our programs. You can get a description of what the program was about, who presented it. If you need to find out something, it's no longer looking at little icons and trying to decide what the whole uh, program was about. And we're really proud of Wanda and the work she's done to make this particular thing happen. By the way, I've got to mention Arno. He's the guy that's doing the, um, the, the Galaxies uh, program, and we're really happy to have him aboard, too. Um, one of the other milestones, <laughs> kind of a cute milestone if you're into it, and we've actually sold 10 items. 10 items, it's cool. We sold 10 items and got a congratulations from whatever of that. Hey, congratulations, you've sold 10. But you can get swag. Swag is cool. And more seriously, um, four, five, three years ago even, when we um, got into this uh, Astro Imaging Channel, we really didn't know who was um, paying the bills, okay? And there were bills. Somebody's got to pay for a website. Somebody's got to pay for um, various things that come up, uh, registration for your domain name. I don't know. There's lots of stuff computer-wise. I don't know. Anyway, so we have to pay for stuff. And uh, somebody would say, God, we got a bill coming up here. Okay, I'll pay for it. Well, we've stopped doing that. We, as you know from last year, we incorporated so that this can go on forever. Even if I get hit by a bus or Eric or anybody else, any one of us disappears, the corporation as such still exists. Now, it's a nonprofit corporation, and we do really appreciate the donations. And we've had some very substantial donations. I'm not mentioning any names because we've been asked to kind of keep it on the quiet who the names were. But, um, and also there's some places where you can put in little donations on the YouTube website. And we really appreciate when you do that. But the important milestone is that we are no longer wondering who's paying for this thing. Eric's our treasurer of the organization and we're, we're doing we're doing well. We still need contributions, but at least we know where they are, where they're coming from, and that we will be able to continue this, even if all of us go broke as individuals. The organization itself can present these shows for you. Mostly, I think, the thing I want to talk about is the people. I put this on Gorgeous Galaxies, this help wanted thing, okay? And I was, I got responses. I got people that wanted to do things and they're doing things. Um, for a long time, it was Adam. And by the way, Adam is still around. He still comes to the, some meetings with us now and then when we have to plan things and stuff like that. Alex, Tolga, Eric, Molly, and Terry, we've been around for a long time arranging presenters and trying to do stuff like that. This year, we're proud to have Tim join us, Wanda joined us, and Arno joined us uh, to help us pull some of this off. 
basically by asking people. So we've got a team of people that are doing it. And of course, we want to thank all our presenters, all of you who've gone out of your way to present a program. We really appreciate that. But all the people that you know, we call the, the vendors, the, the good processors, all the people that we call, hey, they're doing it for free. They're doing it just because they, they love you too. And they want to help out and they want you to make become better imagers. So we appreciate all that. That's the most important part of our organization is the service we do for you guys out there on the S2 Imaging channel. There's two ways to get a hold of us. Uh, you can hit that help one, wanted button over in, um, in uh, Gorgeous Galaxies right now. Or you can go to the contact part of the website and tell us your first name, your last name, tell us how you'd like to help, particularly um, if you'd like to help us with presenting the programs, figuring out how Streamlabs works, mm -hmm. or presenters or everything. One of the things I wanted to be sure that you knew about was um, our volunteers are real important. We organized ourselves so that, well, we sit here in a Google Meets meeting, which is very similar to a Zoom meeting or anything like that. That's easy. But the hard part is taking that and getting it out on YouTube. And we've got three people who are trained to do that. And I just wanted to tell you that because of the exigencies of life, you know, things happen in families and, and people move and people get transferred and stuff like that. We had a really weird situation over the last two weeks where um, they changed all the software on uh, Tolga, who was who was doing it for that time because he was the last guy we could get to do it. And Tolga was very surprised at all that. So we had to put out a show with five or six minutes of us practicing how to do a show. Um, now we did start on time, 9.30 Eastern, just like we were supposed to with the actual content. But there's six minutes of that show that, that is just practicing. Um, and then last week we had a horrible power outage uh, that just basically wiped us out. And we spent two or three hours trying to figure out how we could do Streamlabs remotely like that. And it didn't work. And that's when we finally had to call the show. So we appreciate you understanding all that. We need more people who can help us with that, you know, a, a fourth and fifth person redundancy in the line of people that we do this with. Uh, so, you know, volunteer. We need that volunteer to be a presenter. Anyway, happy anniversary to us. Madison is here to tell us about what um, he has done to build himself a um, portable, um, uh, no, a, a, a movable observatory. Oh, why do I keep saying this? Why don't I just let um, uh, Madison, you out there? Yes. Here. Take over, share your screen and take over. All right. Let's see, you're still sharing, Alex. Am I? Yeah. I, okay. Molly, can you kill my sharing? Um, you'll have to, uh, actually, I could probably kill it. Hold on. Got it. Okay. Okay. Try this again. Okay, how's that? Did everybody see it? Uh, we are seeing your presentation screen, sir. Great. You can go ahead and click the uh, click the hide down there, and uh, when you put right. it back, yeah, there, there we go. Okay, you're beautiful now. Okay, um, I had a small mobile, a, a small uh, backyard observatory for many years, and I always wanted a mobile observatory that I could take to a dark sky site or uh, a star party and stay in it and be comfortable. So in 1999, I designed and had built the trailer you see on the left and used that for a few years. And like everybody else, I got aperture fever and uh, bought a telescope that was too big for that dome and ended up redesigning the trailer and building the units you see on the right. After searching locally, I gave up on anybody local that would, would build this trailer for me. Nobody was interested. So I got on the internet and did a search and found a company that was very enthusiastic about building this trailer to my design, but 
they just happened to be in Prince George, British Columbia, which is just about as far from Mississippi as you can get. But I went ahead and contracted with them to build a trailer. And uh, what you see here is a composite fiberglass molded trailer that is insulated with an inch and a half of blown in foam. And it's sitting on an 11,000 pound suspension with a seal frame under it. I bought a six foot home dome and had the mounting ring for it shipped directly to Prince George to Sabre Industries to be installed on the roof of this trailer. And this is the hole they had cut in the rooftop to install that uh, mounting ring. Here is the interior being constructed. And uh, you can see the cutout that's here for the observing window that, that is in between the cabin area, which is back here, obviously, and the dome area, which is uh, where the picture is being taken from. Uh, here is the bathroom being constructed, and there is a a uh, bunk platform that's being constructed here. Here is the finished product ready to be delivered to me from French George, the rear of it. And here's a front view. I bought this trailer uh, with a delivery date to be in July. Well, like all projects it ran over and it was mid-November before they were ready to deliver the trailer to me. And it was snowing like crazy and being a Southern driver, I was a little bit nervous about driving to uh, halfway to Alaska to pick up this brand new trailer and return to Mississippi with it. So uh, the owner of the company uh, generously offered to drive the trailer halfway and get it across the border and meet me in Billings, Montana. And I still got into a blizzard getting to Billings, but I made it back safe and sound with the trailer. I did have to stop in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma and have a sway controller added to the design because of uh, some weight distribution problems. Here's the trailer sitting in Mississippi, and I've assembled the, the home dome on top of it. And I've also added um, awning. This was a mechanical awning. I had to pull it out manually, which was a real pain. As a rooftop air conditioner. And I took off the single propane tank and added a dual propane tank because uh, I found out really quick the single one wasn't big enough. Here's the trailer set up for use. And as it was delivered, it had mechanical scissor jacks and some jacks of this fashion right here, which were also just mechanical things to level it up. I found that to be highly unsatisfactory for anything but almost a level surface on concrete. At the time, you can see I was, uh, I don't know if you can see, here's the scope. It was a Mulan 250 that I had, a Takahashi. Here's a close up of that scope. And I was using an AP7 camera at the time, which was a back illuminated uh, CCD camera pretty much state of the art back in those days, had a relatively small sensor, but it was back illuminated, so it was highly efficient, but it also required a, a large card to be in a full-size computer to operate it. I was using an astrophysics mount, which was also a very, very nice mount, and this whole system worked, worked nicely for me. The dome rotation was controlled by two motors on either side of this. This is the mounting ring the dome is mounted on that you see here close up. 
And this is the motor that drives the dome. Uh, these wheels turn and it's just a friction drive. There's one on either side of the dome and this synchronizes the dome to the telescope. Well, as delivered, these motors were very, very noisy. It was a, it was a different motor than this one. And the, one of the first things I had to do was uh, find a motor that would be quiet because every time that dome would start to move, it would wake me up if I was trying to sleep while I was imaging. So this happens to be a 1999 Cadillac wind regulator motor, which uh, thanks to Cadillac was super quiet and the dome would just move and, and it was just totally uh, noiseless. To the right of my desk, uh, I constructed a small bookcase so I could keep my reference manuals. I've got a small fridge, very small fridge, only held a couple of six packs of drinks. <clears throat> a small AC powered microwave. And uh, you can look through this window here, which is the in, inside the dome room, and you can see a breaker panel and some other electrical equipment mounted on that wall, which was a very bad mistake on my part because uh, in the dark, I would bump those breakers and cut things off that I didn't mean to turn off and uh, maybe kill my mount or kill something else, and then I'd have to start all over. So uh, when I redesigned the trailer, those got moved. Here is the hole in the floor of the observing deck. The, the back end of the trailer had two floors separated by uh, about two and a half feet. And this hole was in that upper floor so that the uh, pier did not touch the floor at all. <clears throat> Here's a look at the uh, workstation. Excuse me. <clears throat> I had a, uh, a monitor here that had an adjustable backlight so I could dim it. And you can see this, the scope through here. You could look up through the window and see what the scope's doing. All the lighting here uh, is red and white. And this whole area back here is heated and air conditioned, while this area, of course, stays ambient temperature. Here's a close up of the workstation the controller for my uh, inverter charger. This is a watt meter that tells the battery usage and battery life. And of course the monitor, mouse pad, keyboard, and um, this little control would manually move the dome if I needed to. And then this was a controller for the telescope. Here's a narrow band image that I shot through that rig years ago. Um, I guess everybody needs to guess what this is, but I think it, uh, I think everybody knows it's M42. Looking through one of the side uh, doors, access doors, this is in between the two floors of the trailer. This is the bottom of the trailer. And then there's a floor right above this that you can't really see. This is one end of the tripod that supports the pier. And each end of the tripod has a screw jack, just like this one. It goes down through the floor. The floor does not touch the jack frame at all. And these jacks, because I got, uh, the floors were so close together, I didn't have room to put the motors on the jack. So I used a, um, I left a hole in the floor above and used a, a manual uh, crank to crank these jacks down. After having the trailer a very short time, the, the original uh, trailer jacks to level the trailer were, as I said, highly uh, uh, insufficient. So I bought a self-leveling jack system 
from Power Plus, which is a great system. It had four jacks like you see here, two on the front, two in the back. And this control unit, all I have to do is hit this auto extend button. The jacks go down, the trailer comes up and it's level when it stops. Uh, this is the power unit for that system and lots of extra wire rolled up. When I got the trailer, it came with a 1000 watt in, inverter charger and a 500, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, a 50 amp charger. And I found the 50 amps to be insufficient. So I quickly updated to this Xantrex uh, 2000 watt inverter, which charges at 100 amps. The original design of this trailer had this slide out storage area for a portable generator. And I quickly found that most national forests do not want you to use this type of generator while you're in the forest because of a fire hazard. So uh, I quickly decided this was not gonna work and in the new design, that's been eliminated. As I said, I got Aperture Fever and this is a, a, an RCOS 12 and a half inch truss telescope um, with their control system mounted on it. As you can see here, the focusers on the front end of this scope. Uh, I used an Optech filter wheel, which is, this is the control unit for it. And I bought a new Paramount ME for this, this to sit on. Uh, buying the ME caused me to have to cut the pier off six inches. So that was a, a fairly big job to, because this, this mount sits higher than the astrophysics mount. But even doing that and trying my best to, to line this thing up, uh, when I would balance it, I had to be so careful slewing uh, not to run into the side of this dome, it was just unusable. To accommodate the fact that you never know which direction the trailer is gonna be parked in, uh, this is the top of the pier. And this pier was rolled by a local company that builds uh, gasoline tanks. And they rolled it out of one eighth inch aluminum and did just a great job for me. Uh, they put some, some screw, uh, uh, they welded some bolts onto the side of it here. You, you can't really see them, but these uh, hand screws go through those, those holes and the hand screws tighten against a, a one and a half inch thick aluminum plate that is inside this top. And the plate is bolted to the mounting uh, plate that comes with the Paramount. So I can loosen these, there's four of these hand screws. I can loosen them and there's, a, there's also a groove that's cut, that's milled into that plate so that the whole thing can't tip out of the top of the, out of the top of the pier when you loosen it, but you can rotate it. And I can rotate this thing 360 degrees and then lock it and then fine tune it with a normal adjustment that's on the, the mount itself. And you can see what a fine job of cable management I do with my system. And that's a joke, by the way. After taking the dome off the top, I, I donated that to a school and cut this square hole in the top of the trailer. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, what have I done now? Because I had the whole thing torn up and it was gonna take a long time to fix it. And, um, so I, I, I lined the edge of this hole with uh, pre-cured fiberglass, which is nothing but uh, uh, three eight inch thick fiberglass board that I purchased in a big sheet, four by eight sheet and cut the strips out of it that I needed to make these sides out of and bonded them onto the side of the trailer. The lid, had to be molded, it couldn't be flat because when you park the telescope, it sticks up above the top of the trailer. 
So I needed this lid to be curved to accommodate the telescope in the parked position. So after I determined how much it had to stick up, uh, we built this lid uh, out of carbon fiber, half inch aircraft foam, and then another layer of carbon fiber. And I was trying for super strength and low weight. And the whole lid after it was finished weighs 35 pounds and I can jump up and down on the thing and it does not move. Here's the lid under construction. We were laminating the carbon fiber cloth. You can see the, the layers of cloth this way. And then there's another layer that goes on top of this. We had several layers to build up the whole uh, top of the lid. And then we did the same thing on the bottom. Here's the bottom of the mold we constructed. We just bent some plywood to the right shape and waxed it so it wouldn't stick. After molding the, the uh, lid, we set it on top of the trailer to trial fit it, and we had to make patterns for these side panels. Here's a view from the inside. You can see the, the precure that I attached around the perimeter, and then these panels that we were making as patterns and then we have to mold these pieces just like we did the lid out of uh, fiber, out of uh, carbon fiber, aircraft foam, and then another layer of carbon fiber. I also took the opportunity to completely strip out all this old wiring and completely do the wiring in the trailer over. In fact, I gutted this whole area and redid the walls and everything. I was also raising the floor up to accommodate some better jacks. Here's the lid finished and in place as a trial fit. And there it is from the outside. And you can see we're doing fiberglass work on the outside of the trailer to make that joint nice and neat. To make the lid so that I could move it back and forth, it obviously can't slide. And I did have an air conditioner sitting here. And my, my original plan was to have two arms and let this whole thing swing over and, and rest on top of the air conditioner. But that was too unwieldy. So I, I opted to have just the arms at the back and have a track assembly on the front that the thing, a rail assembly that it would roll back and forth on on the front, and then the rear of this thing swings up in the air and over the parked telescope. I had to get rid of the rooftop air conditioner and uh, run the refrigerant line somewhere. The air conditioner unit is mounted right here on the other side of this wall. And this little uh, trace right here made out of fiberglass covers up the refrigerant lines and then they run over to this unit that's in the front. Here's the finished product again. And I designed this spring assist. Takes very little effort to open and close this lid. One person can easily do it. My next project is to motorize this, but I haven't gotten to that yet. Also, I installed this really nice uh, electrically powered awning. It's push the button, it opens, push the button, it closes. Here's a demonstration of the lid opening. Just as easy as it can be. On the back of the lid, I've got two latches like this to latch it for transport. And these are the same latches you would use for a, a boat hatch, lo uh, locker hatch. It's, it, uh, they're very common latches. I've also got all around this lid, you'll see there's a, a aluminum angle that has this uh, rubber gasket that's around it makes a weather tight seal, I can go down the highway and I get no uh, moisture in it at all. 
equipment that I use in this trailer is the uh, Paramount ME, which I have uh, re uh, install. I mean, uh, rebuilt and have the 5000 control system in it. I have the RCOS 12 and a half inch truss telescope that you see here pictured. I'm using an Optech Gemini focuser that uh, Tolga helped me uh, mount to this telescope. And by the way, he did a great job with that. Uh, he also got me an adapter made so that my SBIG STXL 12600 with the grade one chip fits right on there and is in focus where it needs to be. Back focus is perfect. I have a self-guiding filter wheel, adaptive optics, and I'm using this really neat uh, Primalucci Lab Eagle 3 Pro computer that uh, controls the uh, telescope. The original uh, telescope controller from RCOS is, uh, is now obsolete, and it's very difficult to keep one of those things working. Uh, you can't get parts for it. You can't get it worked on, really. So I, before mine broke, I decided to go ahead and just bite the bullet and get Tolga to help me get this focuser on there, eliminate this focuser on the front secondary mirror, and put the focuser in the back. Um, but the temperature control for the mirrors, there's a heater on this mirror, and there's internal heaters here that I installed on the, on the primary mirror, and there are fans back here that were controlled by the uh, original control unit. But the Primalucci lab, <clears throat> along with their ECC temperature and humidity sensor, works perfect for that job. You can uh, set it up to control the secondary and primary mirror heaters, as well as the fans. <clears throat> And this is the camera I'm using, the adaptive, the adaptive optics, the uh, self-guiding filter wheel, and the camera. Here is the 5000 control unit installed, and I'm using uh, their Wi-Sky adapter, which is really great. It eliminates another cable, and this connects directly to a network that I have in the trailer and my Primalucci lab computer connects to the same network and my uh, computer at my workstation connects to that same network. So uh, everything can communicate with as few cables as possible. And I know everybody's looking at that bad wire right there. It's it's really just this outer jacket that's pulled away, but I've ordered a new cable for that. That's the 48 volt power supply for the uh, Paramount. This wire here is the main power wire that goes through the mount and into the, uh, up to the Primalucci uh, computers, whether I'm using the Eagle 3 or I also have an Eagle 4 that I use on my other setup, which I'll get to later. But now you can see what my, uh, cable management looks like. It's a little better than before. Here is the Gemini focuser mounted on the back of the scope, along with the adapter that uh, Tolga had made for me. And again, I'm very, very satisfied with this setup. And I bought a, a shroud uh, sewn by Heather and she did a good job sewing this. It was a perfect fit. And I use that shroud when I'm in light polluted areas, which I, I am in a lot of the time. Here's the scope of a close up of it. Unfortunately, my wires that I had ordered that were the proper length had not come in. So all I had all this extra wire rolled up, but I was also doing some software modifications and had these extra cables run. But you can also see the control panel I built to control the electric jacks, and I'll get to that later. You can see the four hand holes here, a little bit better view of three of them that allow this uh, to rotate. And then here's the fine controls to fine tune the pole. And you can also see my air conditioner unit hanging out on the wall back there. 
Here's the scope in the park position with the lid closed, obviously. And um, the cables are now the right length, so everything looks a little better. I'm getting a, older like everybody else, and that RCOS scope with all that equipment on it, it's just a little bit too much for me to handle to get onto this mount when I get to where I'm going. And obviously you have to take the scope off the mount to travel. So I decided I would buy a smaller telescope that I could handle by myself. And I decided to get this Takahashi FSQ106 ED4. And I'm also using a Takahashi uh, F FS60 as a guide scope. And I bought the little Primalucci Lab Eagle 4 Pro, which you can see mounted here, a little better close up of it here, that controls everything. I've got the Primalucci uh, Asado four inch focuser on this telescope. I'm gonna buy their rotator as soon as it comes out, but I, right now I'm using the manual rotator that you see there that came with the scope. I've got their dew heaters and I'm using a, a QHY 600 color camera. Even though it's a color camera, I have a filter wheel on here because I've got a, um, a UVIR cut filter. I've got a UHC filter and I've got uh, a uh, triad ultra filter and I can swap those out with having, without having to do anything. And I've got this little small uh, ZWO ASI 264 camera on this guide scope. Normally when I get this thing set up and uh, do a proper polar alignment, run my uh, T-point model and turn on the PEC. I can do a five minute exposure with that long focal length scope without any guiding. And I can certainly do it with this one. So this, this really becomes redundant. I, I don't ever use this guide scope. And here's that scope parked. And you can see my big scope on the floor there in the travel position. When I travel, all I have to do is strap this down and it, it rides just fine. And I take the scope off and let the right ascension gear just freewheel with no weights on it, of course. And that prevents any gear damage when I'm going down the highway. Here's the little room air conditioner that I bought to replace that rooftop air conditioner. It's a 700 BTU unit. And since this trailer is insulated so well, it's, it's really like an ice box with that uh, blown in foam insulation. This thing works perfectly. And it's also a heat pump. So I was able to eliminate the propane heater as well. And this thing pulls such low amount of current that it'll, it'll run off my batteries and I can run the heat and the telescope and the computers and everything overnight on my batteries and then run my generator during the daytime. If I'm not where I can plug up, I run the generator in the daytime to uh, charge everything. Of course, you've got to have a bathroom when you travel. So I had this small head constructed. I don't know if you can tell by these views. Anyway, this is a small toilet and over the toilet, I've got a towel uh, shelf constructed here. Here's my, uh, looking through the door, here's the shower head and the little lavatory. And it's very compact, but it works perfectly. And I've got I, enough um, gray water and black water storage to accommodate me for a week or two people for about four days. And then I have to uh, go dump it somewhere, but it it uh, does fine for me for a week. Next to the uh, little head, I've got a uh, hanging locker. 
This is the lower bunk slash sitting area during the daytime. This upper bunk folds up into this position and locks so that you can, you can sit here, or lounge here, and uh, you see my little doggy bed there. I've got a small dog that travels with me. At the foot end of that bunk, I've got a shelf that is intended for a television that I've never installed, but that's where it could go. The upper bunk folds down. You can see the latch for it. That, that's when you push it up, that fall, that's this little lever falls down and locks it. But then the upper bunk is in the, the sleeping position now. And all you got to do is roll a sleeping bag out on top of that. It's very comfortable. I do intend to get some four inch memory foam mattresses made for both of these bunks though, to make it even better. I improved the uh, cooking facilities. I installed this little wave box microwave, which runs on 12 volts. I'm trying to, my idea was to keep everything running off of 12 volts and as little as possible running off of 110 volts. So this wave box was made for uh, truckers. And so I installed one of those and then I installed this Engel refrigerator, uh, which has a compressor, but it also runs on 12 volts. Of course, I kept my bookcase as is. And the refrigerator goes all the way down to the floor from the top of the desk, so it's deep. And I can put a lot of food in there for a week. I even got a little pouch you can put frozen food in if you want to. It'll help keep it frozen for several days, even in that refrigerator. And this thing will actually freeze if you turn it down uh, low enough. And of course, there's a little bit better view of the microwave. This thing works great. Here's my new workstation. I'm using two high resolution monitors that were intended to be used on the back of car seats for uh, viewing movies on the road. And uh, they are uh, uh, high resolution, as I said, and they do a great job. The computer screen looks weird because of the fisheye lens. You can see how I can sit there and look at my scope though and see what it's doing when I'm using it. And here's a view of those same monitors with my Eagle 4 uh, running. Behind my desk, I've got a couple of lights, uh, a red spotlight and then a white one I can turn on. It shine directly over my head and onto the keyboard. And then this is uh, controls for the hot water heater, the water pressure and uh, levels for all the tanks. Here's another view of the, of the uh, desktop. This little remote uh, controls the monitors, they'll dim. These two remotes control the lighting in the trailer. Everything has red lighting and has white lighting and it's all dimmable LEDs. And this one controls the air conditioning. Underneath the desk, here is the computer. It's also a 12 volt computer, a Pentium uh, i7 uh, with an SSD in it. This computer was intended to run the telescope, but then after the Eagle uh, 3 came out, I decided I would buy that. And just this basic thing that this does is just runs the monitors. And then uh, I connect from this to the Eagle 3 via Wi-Fi. Here's a uh, carbon monoxide detector. This is the vent for the bottom of the refrigerator. This is where the old propane heater had been. So I made three drawers for storage, which you can't have too much storage in a small trailer. As you can see, you've always got bits and pieces to go in. And this is my pole master that I use every time I, I go somewhere. And you can't ever carry enough tools you always need something you don't have, as a matter of fact. But 
and I always seem to blow a fuse, so I always carry fuses. Here are the remotes for the LED dimming, and this all works just absolutely great. If you open the doors under there, uh, you can look in under the uh, under the viewing area, and you can see the, the bottom of the pier. You can see that the pier is sitting in there. It has three of these arms or, or uh, panels, as I said, they're bolted onto the pier. They are tensioned with aircraft cables, top and bottom, to give them extra rigidity. On this one, I've got mounted a voltage step up uh, supply. The Eagle computers and the cameras don't like low voltage, uh, even really anything below uh, 12 volts, and it, it'll start uh, cutting out, uh, rebooting, and what have you. So, this keeps that from happening. And generally, I don't get below 12.6, but this thing keeps it up at 13.6 volts. Uh, the, this system here is for the jack assembly, so fuses and some relays. And this is where I plug in the wall wart. That's the 48 volt power supply for my uh, Paramount. On the wall in there is located this uh, uh, alpha uh, Wi-Fi router combination, and it has an external antenna that picks up Wi-Fi. It's a Wi-Fi amplifier as well. Um, this is the level sensor for the automatic leveling jacks. This is mounted to the floor of the uh, upper deck, and you can still see the steel framing that that floor is connected to here. There's an exterior view. Here's the antenna for that Wi-Fi, uh, so I can pick up Wi-Fi in a campground or wherever I am. This is an external vent for the refrigerator as well. I rebuilt the power supply for the whole trailer. I am using this 2,000 watt Xantrex like I uh, bought uh, for the upgrade originally, I have added a remotely uh, disconnect uh, a disconnect switch that's remotely activated for the battery, so that if I in a, an emergency or a fire, I can disconnect that all the interior uh, panel with with the push of a button, and then there are other big breakers for uh, the microwave and some other equipment. This is a shunt that works the uh, uh, watt meter. And these two large cables go to the batteries that are located under the front bunks. And I've, I've got a cover for this Panduit coming so I can neaten all this up. Here's a, a good view of one of the jack assemblies that is at the end of one of these arms on the tripod. You'll notice that the top of it has a little arm here that's it's working a micro switch that's mounted up here. That is a safety precaution. If this jack, if, I, if I'm blindly operating these, if I accidentally were to run it up way too high, it would touch this floor and that switch would put a diode into the circuit it would keep that motor from running in that direction and only let it run in the other direction, which is the down direction. So we, it, it, it couldn't be, you couldn't jack the floor up in here and you know, that prevents damage. Here you can see another view of the Wi-Fi router. Here's the control of the uh, uh, power panel on the inside of the trailer. I've got an AC panel here a DC panel here with some safeties over these two switches. This one is for the, the trailer jacks. I don't want that being accidentally turned on when I've got the telescope installed or uh, jacked down because uh, you, you, you can imagine what would happen if you lowered the trailer and had the telescope uh, in the down position. Uh, this is the switch that controls this panel 
this panel has a voltage regulator on it as well that is the voltage going to all the computers and all the other electronic equipment. This uh, is the uh, generator starter, solar controller. This is the control panel for the uh, charger inverter. This is the watt meter and battery usage indicator. And this is that emergency shutoff that I talked about. And you can also see through there, you can see the telescope back in there through the glass. Here's a close up of the Power Plus leveling system. And there again, all I have to do is hit this auto extend and just stand back and watch it and it levels the whole thing up perfectly. Another picture of the a little bit closer view of the power panel. And this is really close over in here, but it's not touching. Nothing is touching that pier. The other generator was not acceptable, so I bought this generator, which is a, an LP gas operated generator. It's 2,500 watts. And uh, this is the exhaust part that you can see sticking out here. It's in a fireproof uh, compartment that I built is lined with sheet metal. It's also lined with this one inch thick uh, lead foam that's covered with foil and it's hermetically sealed from the rest of the trailer to prevent uh, carbon monoxide through these uh, where, the, where the cables pass through. And like any other generator, it requires a transfer switch. So that's what that is. In the very front of the trailer, under that front bunk, I've got this great big box here, which I didn't open up to take a picture of what's inside, but there's two 8D batteries that weigh about 150 pounds a piece in this box. And those very large cables from the back come through the floor back over here. There's a conduit where it, it comes up and there's also a great big fuse over here. Uh, you can see the top of one of the front automatic leveling jacks right there. Over on the opposite side are the water tanks. And these two are fresh water tanks. This was the original tank, which had 50 gallons and it just wasn't quite enough. So I added another 30 gallon tank and these two are just connected together. So they empty at the same time. And uh, you can see my hot water tank over here and another fuse block that controls uh, everything that uh, has to do with uh, hot water ignition and other electrical stuff in this compartment. Here you can see the top of another jack, the opposite corner, and my uh, pressure water pump. I also had uh, solar power installed. It's only uh, 100 watts, but it does help to keep the battery topped up if I'm just, if the trailer's just sitting out somewhere remote and I'm away far from it during the week, which I have done before. This just keeps the battery topped off. You can see the uh, rails that the lid slides along. There are two linear uh, bearing blocks right here and right here, and it slides up this incline to here to open. And there's a there's a hinge here and here on top of the bearing blocks that allows that lid to pivot. This is this picture is taken from the inside as I'm opening the lid and you can see the, the bearing block here and here. And then it, it had to be on that incline in order to clear this vent and the solar charger. Here is the control panel on the side of the pier for the jack assembly. And each of these three switches is the up and down control for one jack. 
basically in the position shown, you know, uh, this is a control for a pulse width modulated power supply that I built for the jacks so that they could be made to run really, really slow for a fine adjustment of the bubble level on the mount. And I put a key switch on it so that when I get this thing set up, I can take the key out and a visitor can't come along uh, and accidentally hit one of these switches and knock my mount out of level. And I molded this little piece out of fiberglass so that it would, it would fit against the side of that pier perfectly. Here's another view of the, of the way the pier's constructed. Inside this hollow aluminum tube, I had a uh, piece, it's, it's, it's a donut shaped piece of uh, three quarter inch thick aluminum that's welded inside here to act as a, a, a brace inside the, the, uh, the pier. The bottom of the pier is also solid so that when these pieces are bolted on and tensioned with these aircraft cables, which you can see one of them right here, there's no way this can crush. It's, it's, it's absolutely solid in there. The, the thing has a, a hole in it so that the wires can pass through and come out on the other side. There's, there's an access hole that wires can pass through. Also, there are some curved pieces of steel inside that these bolts screw into. So when this whole thing is bolted together with the steel inside the baffle that's in there, it is super, super rigid. Here's a, a view of the access uh, through the floor so that it doesn't touch the uh, pier another one of the aircraft cables that you can see, and the wiring going up to the uh, control panel. Another view of one of the motors with the micro switch on the top. When the trailer is in the, in the uh, used position, you can see two of the uh, pier supports right here for the tripod. And you can see the leveling jacks. Here's one, two there, a third one over here. And then there's a fourth one back here, of course. And there's a third one of these over here. But these, these are in the extended uh, position. You can see they don't touch anywhere and you see the tires are off the ground. You can also see the conduit that's taking those big cables from the back of the trailer up to the front. Another view of the, of the way the tripod's constructed, you can see it absolutely doesn't touch the floor in here at all. When it's extended, it's not touching anywhere. When I retract these feet, they come up and they clamp against these pieces of PVC right here and, and literally uh, clamp that tripod down to this lower floor for transport. Can't move at all. So it's sitting directly down on the floor then and held tight against it. And here's the trailer pushed into its... Uh, a uh, protective place. Uh, the storm was coming this past weekend. And I shoved it in to get it out of the weather. So uh, that's the way I can store it when I want to. And that's my presentation. Oh, that's really, I mean, that's an exceptional piece of construction. Uh, I won't even ask you how much the whole thing cost to put together. I don't even know how much the whole thing costs to put together. But there, there are some, uh, I think what people would like to hear a little bit about is some of the adventures and some of the images that you generated with the trailer. Also, just a question I have, uh, the, 
when you're parked and ready to image, the pier is anchored to the ground or concrete slab or something of that nature. Is that correct? It's sitting on the ground, separate, and, from, separate from the trailer. Isolated from anything inside the trailer. Completely isolated. So do you want to tell us about a few of your adventures in imaging and well, taking the trailer out? You know, the, the thing is, I've, I've had this trailer a long time, but I haven't taken it as many places I, as I probably should have. I've just, I've just retired. So I'll be taking it uh, to a lot more places soon, I hope. And uh, for about 10 years, I was so busy working, I didn't have time to use it at all, so it just sat. So uh, it's a shame it, 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 that that happened, but it did. You know, work and life gets in the way. But I, I am doing some imaging now, and, and I've, I've just got that new setup with the, with the Takahashi scope just in time for uh, uh, all the uh, nebula season, and I'm ready to, to get started with that. I do take the trailer up to French Camp, Mississippi. I belong to a, a little group called the Astro Amigos, and we go up to... Uh, the Rainwater Observatory is kind enough to let us come up to their dark sky site, which is up in North Mississippi. And it's a, it's a great site and it's at a, at a, a private school up there. And uh, they're very kind to let us use their facility. And, and that's where I usually go with this thing. Have you uh, used the, the AO with the, the Arcos? I have, and it works, it works great. Yeah, I think Chandra Sanker wanted to know a little bit more about the um, the AO unit, the S Big AO unit. Now, I know we don't have time for a whole exposition of um, adaptive optics, but tell us a little bit about your experiences with that, would you? Well, it it um, it's hard to say. I've I've always used it, so I don't I don't know much about how it would be without using it. <laughs> So uh, it, I do know that I get very round stars. I mean, and, and I, I, I can image on nights when uh, normally there's there's upper air turbulence and stuff, and 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 you normally just kind of give up, and yet I can come out with a pretty good image most of the time. So uh, it does help. It has to be helping. Do you have any images you'd like to show us? Uh, not on not on this computer. I do not. Oh, what a shame! Yeah, can I'm jump sorry. In <laughs> the, can, I, can I jump in with something about the AO? The what now? Uh, can I jump in with something oh, about yeah. the AO? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so with the uh, oh, what's good? Oh, I just I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's more suited for longer focal length instruments. Uh, when you use an AO, your uh, this is for Chandra. Uh, your um, framing can be a little bit more critical because you would need a suitable guide star somewhere up to around, you know, like say Meg eight to maybe Meg ten or something. That's exactly without, right. a, without without an AO, you can actually go a bit longer and and guide on a dimmer guide uh, guide on a much dimmer star. So that is something else to factor in. So finding the appropriate star is a little bit more challenging with an AO. You're absolutely right about that. It well, can be and, quite challenging, in fact. Well, the the AO is designed to keep that guide star in place optically, rather than bumping your mount, which is Correct. your standard guiding. So, and you're probably at the, I don't want to say the lower limit with the uh, the RCOS, as opposed to you know it would be of no value putting it on on the 106. Oh no, none whatsoever. And, I, I don't yeah. intend to use it at all on that one. And Chandrasekhar, no, it is not adaptive optics in the sense that um, adaptive adaptive optics has lots of different meanings to lots of different people. And you asked, is it laser guided? No, it's not laser guided. It um, it's a very very fast uh, tilt tip mirror, right? That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. It yeah. has it has I think three actuators in it, which which again adjust those mirrors inside right. the AO in order, order to keep the, the guide star. In position, right. but it's I using it's using a guide star. Yeah, and I think of it as just a very fast auto guider, 
and yes. Eric did correct. It just yeah. it has a little refractive element in the middle that bends the life back and forth. It's always chasing the seeing. It doesn't improve yeah. your optics, but it is a very fast auto guider. Yeah. So, and, and again, um, we don't have a lot of time to go into completely everything you need to know about adaptive optics. And the SPIG system is not, is not the same uh, system that shines um, a, a sodium based laser off a sto off the um, upper stratosphere that's 70 kilometers or something like that. No, I mean, no it isn't that. Totally that at all. Animal. Okay. I have a question about the trailer, the mechanics of the trailer. Yes. If I may. Um, I, the two floors are confusing me. Do you have two floors running the whole distance of the trailer? No, just in that back observing room. There's, there's a set of steps. I should have taken a picture of them. Okay. They go up uh, right beside my desk to the left, that little folding, fan folding door. Let me see if I can get to the picture. Well, that's okay. It's, it's just, it's just the, there's the main floor of the trailer, and then there's a, a platform up above that. That's correct. How big is the platform above the regular? Uh, that that area back there is about eight by eight. No, how how tall is it above the regular floor? Oh oh oh, uh, thirty six inches now. Oh, it's that tall. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, how tall is the entire trailer compared to a regular stock trailer? It doesn't look like right now it's any bigger than a standard travel trailer with an air conditioner. That's right. It's not. Okay. Now, how before big, it, how, was, it was 13 feet tall with the dome. And that uh, that can actually get you in trouble in some places. It can. You have to watch for, for bridges that are low. And I, sometimes I would think it was going to hit something when it wouldn't, but it would just look like it was close. It would scare you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, to tell it why'd you cut the dome off? Well, it was it was too restrictive. Uh, I wanted that RCOS scope to work in there, and it was just hitting every way. I couldn't I couldn't do a, a slew without just being so careful because it would hit. And so it was it was about the dome the dome's relationship to the telescope, but it had yeah. nothing to do with the trailer. The dome was too small for the, the 12 and a half inch scope mounted on the paramount. It was just too small. But if it wasn't I, with it the Mulan, it was fine. Okay, so it wasn't causing you trouble driving down the road and stuff like that. That's no. what I was thinking. No, I never had any trouble. I just clamped it into place. I actually used some C clamps and just clamped it into place so it couldn't move. And I just go down the you go down the highway at 70 miles an hour. It didn't care. Did you okay. have to orient it in a certain direction for that? I always put the, the uh, shutter directly forward so okay. that the wind was always trying to blow the thing down and so was, you know, pull it off or something. Did you cause a lot of heads to turn? I did. So, so <laughs> when you lower that pier, if you're on soft ground, do you need to put a a plate or something down for it to you know, level never, out in? I've never had to. Uh, most of the places I go, if it's firm enough to park the trailer on the ground, it's, it's firm enough for that mount to sit. Okay. And um, I can image for a whole night. Now, in between nights, sometimes I have to tweak up the level a little bit and realign just a little bit. But normally for a whole night, I can image without it moving at all, only, even on soft ground. Hmm. Or I, well, what I'm calling soft ground is really wouldn't be – Necessarily, I'm not talking about something you'd bog up in. <clears throat> okay. Hey, um, when you're traveling along, you've taken the scope, the, the tube assembly, which means the cameras and everything else, they all come off as a unit off one dovetail? Well, uh, on the little cam the little telescope, yes, the FSQ-106, that whole thing slides off as one unit. Okay. And you take the weights off also? I do. Okay. I was going to ask you about the possibility of the gears munching each other if you hit a bump. Well, I, I disengage the gears. I leave the deck assembly locked because it's it, it's so lightweight and it, it's not going to hurt it. But okay. the RA gear is the one you have to worry about. So I disengage it. I leave this. Uh, I leave the uh, counterweight arm attached. And then I use some bungee cords to lash it so it can't swing around wildly. 
That's all I have to do. Now, I imagine you pull this with a VW microbus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll actually with my Tesla. Really? <laughs> no, no. Way anyway. Oh, you had me going. Okay. That was not I, I nice of old, you. <laughs> I had an 11,000 pound suspension put under it because I didn't know how much it was going to end up weighing. Yeah, how much? But it, it weighs 8,500 pounds. And my Ford F-150 is good to pull uh, 9,000 pounds, so I'm, I'm perfect. Mm. And it pulls it like it's not even back there. Okay. That's about 700 pounds of tongue weight. Uh, so, uh, can you tell us why you switched from the uh, 1200 to the ME? Oh, yeah, I can tell. I like the fact <clears throat> that the ME has the uh, home position that it remembers. Uh, the, the 1200, if I had any kind of a little glitch, I would have to completely start it over. But it was a fine, fine mount otherwise. And I think now they they have the same basic software that uh, the ME has. Plus the ME, you know, it had, it had uh, uh, the T-point modeling and all that you could do with it. And I don't know if that's available for the astrophysics mount. I, I'm not sure. It, it, it happens to be with, um, with upgraded software and the encoder system. Yeah, well, I never, ever had a problem with it, though. I mean, it was a, it was a workhorse. And I had it in my little dome in the backyard uh, for a long time, and I enjoyed that mount. And uh, I actually went to astrophysics and visited Roland up at, at the at his uh, factory, and was very impressed with everything they do. Okay, I've got to now say, get your questions in if you've got any more questions in there. Um, and you're getting a lot of compliments there, Madison. You're well, going to be able to read I, I that later. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you guys for all the hard work you do for this channel. It's a real asset to the uh, amateur astronomy community. Well, it is a labor of love. Uh, I, I really love the evolution of a mobile observatory. That was fantastic. Yeah. All the changes that you, you suddenly say, oh, I didn't consider this. <laughs> Well, I, you know, when I had the thing built, I didn't consider how big the tripod was going to need to be underneath those floors. And I had some extra compartments put under there that, that turned out to be in the way. So the first thing I had to do was chop out the all those compartments and, and free up some space for that tripod to go under there. Madison, how much of the actual work on the trailer do you do, or do you need to bring in some help? I do almost all of it. I did a pretty bit of this redesign and, and refit. Uh, my partner helped me with it uh, on the on the first one, but then this one he he died. So on this one, I've had to I've done it all myself. So you're the electrician, the carpenter, the engineer. Well, I'm an electrical engineer. I own a, a company that that uh, we have a, a hangar that you saw there at the at the airport where it sits. And in the back of that hangar building, we've got a woodworking shop for our business. So it's really handy. I can run back there and make anything I want to make. Hmm. And I have some machine uh, tools. I have a lathe and a mill and a bunch of things. Uh, now, I farmed out all that metal work to other shops. I don't, I'm not, I, I can't weld aluminum or anything like that. So we farmed all that out, but, but everything else, all the woodwork in there, uh, I fabricated every bit of that. Okay, I got to ask. I got to ask, even though it's cruel. So, if you were going to build yourself a trailer to haul around the telescope, what would you do now? Oh, I don't know that I'd do anything different. I, I would know now how to design the thing so I wouldn't make the mistakes I made the first time. But my this trailer is so comfortable, and everything about it works perfectly. Uh, I made all the changes I needed to make. The only thing I want to do is either electrify that that uh, lid assembly, or do some kind of a hydraulic thing to make that operate automatically. Oh, as I was going through my questions here, I did think of one other thing. Do you have one? 
big battery source down there, or do you have a separate battery system for the uh, imaging telescope stuff versus oh, just, the house just, stuff? They're just one big battery source, two 8D batteries. And I'm a, they're, they're AGM batteries, uh, which are glass, glass mat okay. type cells, uh, maintenance free, huge, mm -hmm. big cells. I'm going to, I'm in the process of trying to find some uh, 8D lithium ion batteries, which I'm going to put in there. I, of course, you can find them, but the price is ridiculous. Yeah, right. They're like $3,500 a piece. And if everything's working, you, you know, you don't need to go there. Well, most of the, you know, most of the places I go, I can plug up. So mm -hmm. the batteries are sort of a non-issue but then there have been a few places that I wanted to go. Uh, we went out to a remote uh, forest uh, in uh, southern Louisiana with a, with a star party group uh, several years ago, and there was you, we were 20 miles from the nearest power. So uh, I strictly used my batteries and generator, and, and that's really when I discovered that what I had was totally inadequate. I had to redo it, so that's that's what led to this, uh, that redo of the power system. Okay, well, folks, we've had a fun evening, <laughs> imagining someday we'll do that ourselves. Um, next week, we've got planetary imaging with Neil McNeil. Um, we are always looking for more volunteers and presentations. You know that we've got stuff coming up in August. We've got open dates. Is there anybody else? I think, Eric, we've gotten through all the questions, haven't we? Uh, all the questions and a few more. Okay. Then we are ready to say good night and turn it over to Captain Molly. Molly. All righty. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night.